Hi everybody, welcome to video number three. In this one, we're going to be talking about impact. More specifically, we're going to be answering this question. How do you know if you're actually helping? Now, I have to admit, if we're not careful, this topic can be a bit of a bummer. And I know this from experience. I've written about this before. And then I had people give me feedback that uh, they were just disappointed and felt like, man, if I don't know that I'm actually helping, why should I even try? <laughs> Instead, I hope what happens is you watch this video and you feel empowered by it because you know how to ask better questions and you know that what you're doing actually is helping because you're answering those questions. The reason this matters is because we are over optimistic that our help actually works. So many of you have experienced this before where somebody swooped in to help you and Turned out they didn't do much, but they went on whistling, feeling good about themselves and didn't actually make your life better in any measurable way or any sustainable way. This is a common human experience, actually. And alternatively, some people don't realize that they're having a huge impact in somebody's life because they're not paying attention to how their help actually makes a difference. This over optimism, though, the first thing I was talking about that we we tend to assume that our help is helpful is something that's actually been studied by a couple of my colleagues. They produced this really fascinating paper where in their research, they asked people to sort of estimate the, the likelihood of success for a pro-social initiative. In this case, it was helping uh, people in prison to uh, get parole and stay out of prison more quickly and more sustainably. And so they gave this scenario to respondents in a variety of different situations. And what the research showed is that when people are thinking about a pro-social endeavor, and you can apply this idea to the individual ways we help people or systemic bigger programs, when people are considering a pro-social endeavor like this, they're, those people are more likely to assume that it will succeed than fail. So rather than kind of weighing all the evidence equally, they're more likely to assume that the, that the idea is going to work and it will make the world a better place and help people who need it. Their study also showed that, that people give more weight to positive feedback than negative feedback when it comes to these pro-social endeavors. And what that means is you might be told, oh, here's some reasons it won't work, but here are some reasons it will work. You're much more likely to trust and believe the reasons that it will work. And therefore, you'll undertake the activity, even if it turns out that it was a bad idea. And so we can be and naturally are over optimistic that our efforts to help others actually work. What that really requires of us, though, is to have the humility to ask this question. How do we know if we're actually helping? Because the reality is, if we found out later that what we did didn't make a difference, then we would be sad and feel like we like our effort was wasted. Well, rather than making that realization cause, it, cause us to give up, what we ought to do instead is to have that realization impel us to make sure that what we're doing is actually helpful. The best way to answer that question is to actually ask two more questions. And these are the two most fundamental questions you can ask when you're trying to decide if a thing you want to do is actually helpful. And these are the questions. The first question you should ask is, what if I don't do this? And the second question, what could I do instead? I call this first question the counterfactual question. And what we mean by a counterfactual is, is uh, the, the idea of a counterfactual is what would happen if something else had not happened. And so this, and often we do counterfactual thinking going backwards, and this is something that's studied in psychology something called counterfactual thinking. Here we're going to apply our ability as human beings to imagine a future. And we're going to, so we're going to do it forward. And we're going to ask this question, what if I don't do this? So we're going to try to think of the counterfactual. And then the second question I call the opportunity cost question. And this is a concept from economics. Everything you do comes at the cost of your next best option. That next best option, the thing that you decided not to do because you chose strategy A, Strategy B is your opportunity cost. And it's important in everything you choose to be thinking about the opportunity cost, including the ways that you could help people. So we're going to talk about these two questions in turn. First, the counterfactual question, and then the opportunity cost question. Answering this question, what if I don't do this, requires us to make what's called a causal inference. And that essentially is saying, does, does X 
does doing X lead to Y, meaning does X cause Y? The best way to measure this is through something called a randomized control trial, sometimes called an RCT for short. And to just briefly describe how an RCT works, essentially you're going to take one group who gets the help, another group who doesn't get the help. The people in the first and second groups are randomly selected, meaning that you sort of randomly choose who's in group A and who's in group B. And then when you provide the help and then compare the outcomes to, of the group that got the help and the group that didn't get the help, then you know whether or not the help made a difference. And so a randomized control trial is the best way to know if a certain kind of help is actually beneficial. Um, RCTs are used all the time in medicine, for example. They're being increasingly used in humanitarian aid projects. And there are some great, incredible, intelligent people who are pioneering the use of RCTs in things like humanitarian aid. The, the, problems are, the problem with an RCT is that it's expensive and time consuming. Right? You have to have the researchers, you have to follow and collect data on the two gr comparison groups. Uh, you have to wait enough time for whatever intervention you're using, whatever help you're providing. You have to wait for that to actually make a difference. And so these are, these are hard to do. And so where RCTs are unavailable or, or impractical, then there are some next best ways to make approximations. Two examples of ways to do that are through pre and post testing. So rather than having a comparison group that doesn't get the help, you rather test the group that you were helping before they get the help and then again after they get the help. Another way to do this, another alternative to RCTs that aren't quite as good but still beneficial, is doing cohort studies. And this is where you look at multiple similar groups and then sort of break out patterns of, of, of what's different in their life based on certain differences. And so it's sort of like doing a retrospective RCT of sorts. Now, you may be wondering at this point, why is Aaron uh, talking about things like RCTs when this is a class about informal helping, the little ways that we can help each other? How could you ever do an RCT, for example? Well, it's important to understand where the evidence is found, how we come to discover what's helpful and what's not. And so, for example, if you want to help somebody, one thing you could go do is look at the research and try to figure out what is what tends to be helpful here. Even just a Google search can get you started on the path of figuring out what's helpful and what's not. But the best evidence of what's helpful is going to come from something like an RCT. Now, there is a danger to this kind of thinking, to counterfactual thinking generally, but more specifically to the kind of measurements that you do to establish a scientifically reliable counterfactual. And what this does is it can lead us into something called measurability bias. This bias is where we only work on problems that can be easily measured. We find ourselves being feeling, like, oh, well, I have to spend my energy on something that works. The only way to know if it works is if I can measure it. So I'm only going to focus on problems that I, that I can actually measure. There are some problems and drawbacks to measurability bias. It leads us, for example, to prefer short-term outcomes over long-term ones. Measuring long-term outcomes is hard and also requires a lot of patience. And so if we want to measure things, we're going to measure the things that can be measured quickly, the short-term ones. Measurability bias also leads us to prefer solving easy problems over hard ones because easy problems are a lot easier to measure as well. Some examples of measurability bias. At an individual level, for example, you might want your kid to really gain a love for reading. And so what you'll do is you'll incentivize them to read a certain number of minutes per day rather than thinking about why you want them to read, which is to improve their thinking or their empathy, for example. A measurability bias would lead you to focus on the minutes per day that your child is reading rather than actually looking at how are they improving their thinking? Are they talking about the books they love? Are they sharing stories with friends about the books they love? Are they implementing lessons from books in their day-to-day -day life? That's harder to measure, but it's what you really want. At a bigger level, like at a policy level, an example of measurability bias is, is trying to reduce gunshot deaths by improving trauma surgery. When people get shot uh, it, related to a crime or to a mass shooting, um, you know, one of the things that's more likely to reduce the number of deaths is to make sure that trauma surgery is really effective. Now, that doesn't mean we don't want good trauma surgeons, 
But if the only thing you do is focus on improved trauma surgery, people are going to keep getting shot. And that's not really solving the root cause of the problem, which is obviously going to be a much more complex and difficult problem, even considering how hard trauma surgery can be. This measurability bias uh, can lead us astray from really tackling the hard problems. And, and hard problems, and the reason we avoid them is because hard problems are typically hard problems typically involve hard to measure outcomes. All right, let's move on to question number two. What could I do instead? The opportunity cost question. We always have alternatives available to us and anybody we're helping, we can probably help in a variety of ways, but we typically can only maybe choose one or two of the range of options available to us. So every time we decide to help, we should weigh that help that we choose against the next best alternative. It's important to emphasize that alternatives have to be real, not imagined. It's easy when you're in a position as a helper to wish that you could help in ways that are unavailable to you, wishing that you could solve problems for your loved ones in ways that you just don't have the resources or skill to solve. We shouldn't let ourselves get down with things that are impossible to us. It's good to focus on real, not imagined alternatives. Um, and it is worth pointing out that identifying all of the ways you can help can be time or resource intensive. For example, uh, this is regarding general opportunity costs. Let's say you're trying to pick a major, a major that will make you a more helpful person in your life, doing a career that's meaningful. Well, you could take lots of classes to explore that, but there will come a point at which taking one additional class is not going to be helpful to you because it's adding too much of the time and, and requiring too many resources for you to finally make a decision. So this is one of the problems with opportunity costs is we could explore our opportunities forever and never actually make a choice. So there comes a practical point where we just have to pick. One of the dangers of the opportunity cost question is it can lead to things called optimization traps. And this is where we maximize some things at the undesirable expense of other things. We think, well, I've got this opportunity. I'm going to focus on this. I mean, I've got this kind of help I want to do. I'm going to focus on this. And maybe we over-focus on it and, and lead to other undesirable things. One example of this is in, uh, the, in the literature, there's a movement behind something called long-termism, which is recognizing that future people are as important as present day people. So should, we should be doing things to help future people. But you could see how an overemphasis on future people would lead us to neglect the people that we have around us today. A benefit, though, of the opportunity cost question is it helps us to avoid what I like to call anti-solutions. And so this is a, a term I coined to describe this. It's a partially effective solution that prevents adoption of a better one. We often have already committed to a helping strategy of some kind. We're trying to help someone that we love, and we've already engaged in that help. Well, what an anti-solution does is it sort of gets part of the way there, but then it fills all the space so that we can't adopt a better solution. Uh, anti-solutions are hard to abandon because we fear that if we abandon the anti-solution that things will be worse off. They discourage others from participating in helping solve the problem because they see a partial solution in place. They don't know what the alternative would have been. And because there's a partial solution there, they turn their attention to other things because they don't know what they could have been doing instead. And anti-solutions are supported by those who benefit from the problem persisting. And so that helps them stay in place. Because if a partial solution makes life better for another person who benefits from this problem persisting, then, uh, then the, the anti-solution helps that person maintain their dominance over the outcome. Two examples of anti-solutions. Staying in a bad relationship or job versus making room to find a better one. You might be in a job that you're just not really enjoying, um, but it pays the bills. You really wish you had time to find a better job, but you don't have time to find a better job because you have to work the current job. And if you stop working the current job to find a better one, you maybe take on risk of not being able to afford your rent or groceries. And so the current job that's suboptimal is the anti-solution here. A more policy level or systemic example of an anti-solution is where we focus on the legality of abortion versus implementing policies to reduce unwanted pregnancy. We seem to have this big fight over the legality of abortion. And there are important aspects of that fight for sure. But one thing that we could all agree on is that we ought to have fewer unwanted pregnancies. I don't think there's any proponent of unwanted pregnancies. 
And so if we could reduce unwanted pregnancies, we would reduce the opportunities for abortions to even happen. But we seem to be focused so much on the legality issues that we don't focus on the, the bigger opportunities of reducing unwanted pregnancies. And so this policy effort to either make abortion legal or illegal that is just an anti-solution. We could be collaborating together instead on policies that reduce unwanted pregnancy. The overall point is that anti-solutions keep us from making room. We need to make room for effective solutions to be able to do their work. Now, you remember in, in the previous video, we talked about the difference between ministered help, which is the one-on-one -on -one helping, versus system, systematic help, which is the help that, help, that, that, that works through procedures or programs and does it at scale. Well, the counterfactual question is an interesting and difficult one with ministered help because it's impossible to measure a one-on-one -on -one interaction with something like an RCT. You'd have to replicate that over many times and get a random selection of people to benefit from your help and then check it against a random selection of people who didn't benefit from your help. I mean, if we're talking about a way you might help a neighbor or relative, it's just, it's not feasible. One thing there, though, that could help is pre and post testing, where you pay attention to what life was like before you helped this person and what life is like for them after you've helped them. The opportunity cost question is easier to measure for ministered help because it's easy to switch from one strategy to another, generally speaking. If you're helping a person, you're probably not in a situation where you're so overly committed to the way you're helping that you can't change your mind and try helping in a different way. When you get to the systematic level, though, that changes. Both of these change. First of all, when you're doing systematic help, you can measure, thing with our, measure things with RCTs. There are still ethics issues to consider, though, because how do you choose who gets the help and who doesn't? <laughs> that, that, raises important ethic, that raises important ethical issues that, that people have talked about. But when it comes to the opportunity cost question, this actually becomes harder because if you're helping people systematically, there are systems in place and programs in place, and it's going to be harder to pivot to a new program or system. And so switching can be more challenging if you're trying to try new or maybe better ideas. So to summarize, ministered help is harder to measure, but it's easier to change strategies. Systematic help is easier to measure because you can do things like RCTs, but it's harder to change strategies because of the systems in place. All right. Now, what about the big problems? Like, what about the big, messy problems? I mean, all of us have loved ones, for example, who just have had a really hard time and have all kinds of things that they're wrestling with all at once. What about those situations? How do we think about what we can do that actually has an impact? Well, for this, we're going to draw for, from two really important and potent ideas. The first one is something called the wicked problem, and the second one is an idea called incrementalism. Wicked problems were an idea originally developed by Horst Rattel and then later by uh, further developed by Melvin Weber. And these are large, unique, socially complex, hard to explain, constantly changing, and impervious to simple solution kind of problems. These are the sorts of problems that have all of these attributes. And this isn't just like a random list showing how hard these are. These are all intentionally and specifically listed as descriptors of wicked problems. They're large. They're not like anything else. They involve, uh, they involve co complex social realities where people don't agree on the right solution. They can be hard to fully explain. They're changing all the time and you can't solve them through a simple idea. So they defy typical problem-solving approaches. Here list, here's a list of examples of commonly cited wicked problems. Climate change, school shootings, recessions, obesity, discrimination, war. These are all, at a social level, examples of wicked problems. And I wonder if it's got you thinking about wicked problems that you've encountered in the lives of people around you. What are the problems they have that are large and complex and impervious to simple solutions? Problems that are constantly changing, so they're harder to solve. These would be wicked problems in an individual's life, not necessarily at a social level. And what makes wicked problems so challenging is it makes it harder to answer our two questions. When you think about wicked problems, how do you determine counterfactuals? And how do you determine opportunity costs? How do you know what your alternatives are of what you could do? And how do you know what would happen if you didn't act? Wicked problems make it harder to answer these questions. So if you've been vexed 
with the with the wicked problem of a loved one just know that that's their nature they are by definition vexing problems now it's important to understand that there are traps though that we can fall into when we confront wicked problems uh dr harini Negre, ne, sorry harini Najendra and dr ruth de Fries wrote this really great paper talking about wicked problems and they said that these are the two most important traps that come when we face wicked problems wicked problems can lead us into a trap of, test, t of trusting what they call tame solutions and a tame solution is one that doesn't have the it doesn't have the capacity to sort of rein in a wicked problem and so we put too much trust in simple ideas sometimes when we face wicked problems and that's one trap another trap though of wicked problems is we decide not to act this problem is so hard so complex that we're not even going to try well these it's important to recognize these are traps and wicked problems are solvable and we're going to be talking next about how to do that and really this kind of brings up an important third question when you're facing a wicked problem and it defies an easier tame solution then the next question we ought to ask is what can i do now meaning that sure this is going to take a long time to solve this problem but today is the day i have an opportunity to act and what should that action be and i call this the urgency question and that's where we get to incrementalism and the idea behind incrementalism is to think about small changes over time and the pioneer the original pioneer of this idea of incrementalism is dr charles limblom who wrote a, a great and 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 sort of groundbreaking paper called the science of muddling through and here he's talking about policymakers, people that are trying to solve the big wicked problems we talked about and he had this to say about it he said you know a wise policymaker expects that his policies will achieve only part of what he hopes and at the same time will produce unanticipated consequences if he proceeds through a succession of incremental changes he avoids serious and lasting mistakes in several ways recognizing that we can't solve big complex or wicked problems all at once instead what we can do is attack them incrementally we sort of look at the piece that we can that we can solve now and focus on that and then once that's done we move on to the next and so on continually revising and improving our strategy and learning as we go we avoid these mistakes in helping with incrementalism or the using the approach of incrementalism by doing these sorts of things we learn from the past so we pay attention to what we've done before and didn't work and we deliberately try different strategies we use what we know it's tempting to try to help in ways that extends beyond our knowledge and that's not always going to work it often fails actually and so instead we focus on what we know and begin there we can also take the time to increase what we know so we can be better helpers that way too we can test predictions we can try a little thing and see what happens and if it works we go on to the next little test and then finally we can remedy mistakes quickly if we've done something wrong we can fix it and so we aren't stuck with a strategy that just continues to fail one of the benefits of an incremental approach is at an individual level it can lead to increases in hope dr rick snyder was a pioneer in this regard and he developed hope theory which is a psychological measure of how hopeful we are about the future and what he found is that hope involves three things it involves having goals for the future having pathways where you can see ahead a way to accomplish those goals and the third element is having agency or believing that you have the capacity to work toward those goals you actually have the opportunities and resources to do that and so you can see how incrementalism can feed into hope incrementalism gives you goals that are achievable you can more easily find pathways for the small steps rather than the big long scary ones and it gives you a feeling of agency and power that you can work toward these incremental steps and 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 there's lots of research that shows that people who are experiencing hope um, gain all kinds of benefits as a result and i want to emphasize incremental steps not only improve the hope of the helper but they also improve the hope of the person being helped when somebody feels like they're being helped they're hopeful and they can see the help actually making a difference it makes them feel more empowered and there's some interesting research to support that as well so when dealing with the with the really complex problems the wicked problems 
It's important to understand that the best impact, the biggest way to make a difference, is by taking an urgent but a long view, recognizing that you have ways to act today, and that's the urgency question, but also recognizing that the help is going to take time. And if you're in it just for a moment, then you're only ever going to be able to solve easy problems. If you want to solve the hard, complex ones, you have to ask yourself, are you patient enough to have an impact? Now, regarding impact, I want to wrap up by bringing us back to the, to the flourishing stuff that we talked about a couple of videos ago. What does it look like? What, a, what does a person's life look like if we actually helped them? Well, bringing back those flourishing factors from the Harvard measure, are they happier and more satisfied with life? Are they healthier mentally and physically? Are they feeling greater meaning and purpose? Are they living with more integrity and with more virtue? Are they enjoying close social relationships with people around them? Are they stable financially and materially? Well, if you're helping a person, hope, hopefully you're helping them toward these ends. And how will you know if you're helping? You'll have a good answer to these questions. What if I didn't do this? And what could I do instead? Now, what I'd like you to do now that you've watched this video, when you come to class, I want you to come with a problem that we can use for practice. We're going to answer our, our counterfactual question for the problem example that you bring and the opportunity cost question. And we'll probably also talk about the urgency question. So thanks, everybody, and I look forward to seeing you in class next time.